we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Oh, it was, supposed to was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. because they ruled, you know, it was against international law. Uh, and uh, if we left the ECHR, JJ, we could actually take, the, uh, take a plane off tomorrow. Uh, now, this is a major sea change for Rishi Sunak, saying that he will consider leaving the ECHR uh, if his Rwanda plan gets blocked. Yeah, but he's saying he will consider it. He's not yeah. saying, I'll definitely no, do it. I get just, it. Yeah. <laughs> every <a> few words. <laughs> every words from Sunak. He'll never do it. And what, why would he go through all that trouble to send 200 migrants to Rwanda? And then we'll probably get about eight migrants to Rwanda because we've got to part of the deal. We've got to take some people mm. from them as well. It's pointless. It's absolutely pointless. He'll never do it. He's, he's just going to keep on banging on, banging on. But let's have a look at Sunak talking yesterday. I believe that our scheme, including the Rwanda part of it, all our plans to tackle illegal migration. Let me just but answer if, the question, Harry. I believe that our plans are compliant with all our international obligations, including the ECHR. But right, I believe that border security and controlling illegal migration is more important than our membership of any foreign court. Well, finally, welcome to the party. We've been saying this, not necessarily you, but I've been saying this for years. Leave the ACH, ECHR, then we are masters of our own destiny. We can do what we like. If we want to fly people to Rwanda or anywhere else for that matter, we can, and no judge in Strasbourg is going to stop us. So Rishi's finally saying this, but as you quite rightly imply uh, there, JJ, it's a bit late for all this now. Yeah. Uh, so just, like, sending, leaving the ACHR... Sending people to Rwanda is not going to stop people coming to this country. It's not going to, it's not going to stop. It's well, not, it won't stop it. Because there's only been two, 200 or so people will ever go to Rwanda. Yeah. Uh, Rishi's faith in the fact that we'll take an aeroplane off eventually, maybe with about 10 migrants on board, his faith in, the, in his belief that that will stop the migrant crisis will stop migrants coming across the channel. It's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's not going to work. Uh, moving on, uh, let's talk about the Gaza airstrike, that terrible tragedy. Seven people killed uh, in an Israeli dro drone strike there in Gaza, three of them Brits, of course. Uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, as a result of that, is under pressure to stop Britain selling arms to Israel. Uh, he told, uh, never mind the ballots last night, that uh, Britain is very careful about weapons sale licensing, uh, but he expects Israel to comply with international law. In other words, folks, we are going to continue selling arms to Israel. Yeah, and Saudi Arabia. 
We, we, we make billions, about 20 billion, I think, we make from selling weapons to these countries who do with them as they wish. Saudi Arabia's been bombing the hell out of Yemen for how many years? Mm. And that's not going to stop happening. And yet the UK will continue to sell because it's, it's a good source of income for us. Nothing that anyone says is going to stop that from happening. By the way, if Britain stopped selling uh, arms to Israel, it wouldn't really make any difference. The only country that would really stop Israel in its tracks if it stopped selling weapons to it is America. Mm. We don't sell enough weapons to Israel for it to make that much difference. So this, to an extent, is an academic debate. We've got all these judges today, right, or former judges, writing a letter saying, oh, it could be that uh, selling arms to Israel is against international law. Yeah, so what? You're retired. You're not judges anymore. <laughs> Don't care. That woman with the spider badge. What's her name? Brenda Hale? Lefty. They, uh, have a point. <laughs> they have a point. If... if <laughs> If, and it's a big if, if Israel is found to have committed genocide, whether it's in 20 years' time in the courts, if they're found to have committed genocide, anyone who has aided and abetted that is also guilty of genocide. And if they deem that us selling them weapons has aided that, then... We're then well, well put Rishi goes to prison. <laughs> See, it's, in, not, it's international yeah. law. It never really amounts to a hill of beans. It's just yeah. academics talking in their debating society, their high-faluting ivory towers. Uh, it doesn't really relate to real life. International law uh, is something that most citizens don't care about, don't understand, can't see the point of. Uh, there is a point of it, of course, but uh, in this instance, I don't think uh, Britain will stop selling arms to Israel, but if it does, it won't make any difference anyway. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, still with uh, last night's uh, stonking edition of uh, Never Mind the Ballots, the Sun's great new programme. You can watch it, by the way, on the Sun's website, I think sun.co.uk, uh, or uh, you can watch it on YouTube and you can still get it on Catch Up on Talk TV, of course. Uh, have a look, it's well worth it. And uh, in that, this uh, interview, we were conducted uh, by uh, a very fiery Harry Cole. Uh, he, uh, Rishi said that uh, Boris is very welcome to join him on the campaign trial. Uh, let's have a look at uh, Rishi last night on Never Mind the Ballots. When was the last time you spoke to Boris Johnson on the phone? Uh, I don't know, actually. I spoke to him Were you going to join you on the campaign trial? I, I spoke to him in person at the end of last year, and we've messaged since then as well. Is he going to join you on the campaign trial? Are you going to share a platform? In general, what about Liz? Are you going like, to share general, share general, look, anybody, three of you stand any, there together? Anyone from the Conservative family who wants to see a Conservative government re-elected and doesn't think Keir Starmer is the right person to lead our country will be welcome on the campaign trail, right? Because ultimately, that's the choice. There you go. Open well. invitation to Boris to stand with Rishi on the platform. What do you think the chances of that happening are, <laughs> JJ? I, you know, what, actually, I think Boris may do it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think he will. If Boris can come in and he's not going to save the party, but he might save them from complete and utter massacre. Yeah. Um, it would be good for Harry to let Sunak answer a question before he follows up with another question, though. Is Boris going to join you? Well, I suppose. Oh, what about Liz Trust? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you mates might say that. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> and uh, uh, meanwhile, in the same interview, a very wide-ranging interview, and I've got to say, uh, you know, Harry was on great form. Rishi, I thought, was on very good form. I mean, you, you realise when you see him in an interview like this, it, it, you know, for all his hopelessness and for all his haplessness, he's a nice guy. He's well-intentioned. And he came across very well. Uh, but as the analysts after the interview uh, concluded, he didn't really say much. He's a master of PR, uh, you know, media interviews in which he seems very loquacious, but he doesn't say very much. But one of the things he did comment on, and I think it's about time, uh, there's this law where it, the implication is that homeless people will be arrested uh, if they smell, uh, if they smell bad. Uh, and he uh, said that's absolutely not true. Uh, but in the same law... They want to crack down on nuisance behaviour, and this does apply to homeless people, uh, with fines of up to £2,500. You try fining a homeless person £2,500, what do you think the chances are of uh, that I'm person being able to pay that? Yeah. Uh, but uh, let's have a look at uh, Rishi last night. We have a law in this country dating back to the 1800s called the Vagrancy Act, which essentially does yeah. criminalise people simply for having nowhere to live. And that's not right. Yeah. And what we have said we're going to do is repeal that law. What we are going to do is make sure that the police have the powers they need to tackle behaviour that is intimidating to other people, because I think it is important that people are able to walk around their local communities without fear of being intimidated. So I think it's right the police have the powers to tackle that.
It's funny these ancient laws. Uh, I like this. Uh, we're going to talk about the hate law, new hate laws in Scotland in a little while. I found out uh, last night. I was reading about it, and uh, it replaces Scotland's. I think it was something like 1847 blasphemy law. Uh, so these are these ancient laws, like our ancient vagrancy law. I mean, they do need updating, but not if you're going to arrest homeless people if they reek. This vagrancy law comes from the Napoleonic Wars. It was <laughs> to stop stop soldiers coming back from there being homeless on the streets. That was that was the original interesting, vagrancy law. Interesting, interesting. Um, but and yet we've still got that syndrome going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. We've still got veterans on the streets. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. However, as you say, fining someone two and a half grand who is homeless makes no sense. Throwing someone in prison because they are homeless makes no sense. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't tackle the cause of homelessness. And then to say, if someone smells, that is a public nuisance. Well, what if, what if you're not homeless and you just stink? <laughs> what if that's the case? I walk past people all the time in Hackney who just smell. They're not homeless, they just don't wash. Well, you know, maybe people could get arrested for because uh, the police don't like the smell of their aftershave or something like that. <laughs> that could be. You know, this aroma <laughs> legislation is uh, <laughs> kind of worrying, isn't it? Uh, so uh, let's talk um, about uh, Rishi's general predicament because... Oh, wait, what... wait actually, sorry. I want to, before we, before we please, move on, I want to do. talk about the local election coming up because he touched on that and he, he spoke about Birmingham so I, wanted, I just want to touch well, on that well we've got to be careful here mate don't forget <laughs> Perda and all that seriously yeah, 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 no, be careful but, <laughs> go on but he said Sunak said that um, it's a great opportunity the upcoming local elections a great opportunity to highlight Labour holding power in places such as Birmingham because they're expected or it's predicted the Tories may lose 500 town hall seats um, and face yeah we've got those coming races. up soon uh, but uh, other parties are available uh so uh, those ele elections are coming up soon. Uh, let's talk about, uh, and we'll get a good indication in the local elections about exactly where the Tories stand. And it's not in a very good place. Uh, there was a massive uh, poll yesterday by YouGov, uh, really wide ranging, you know, many, many people taking part, thousands and thousands taking part. So it's the widest ranging poll so far about the Tories' electoral chances, and it turns out it's not good news. Uh, it, according to this poll, the uh, Labour is on course for a landslide victory, bigger than Blair's wipeout victory in 1997, and the predicted result, according to this poll, is Labour 403 seats, Conservatives 155 seats, uh, Shame Alex isn't here, because I could then say, and the prediction for Reform UK is no seats. Zero. Uh, but uh, seriously, let me talk about the main players. This is terrible news for uh, Rishi, isn't it? It is, but the only poll that matters is the one that happens on the day that you vote. That is it. Uh, the polls are a good indication, generally speaking. I don't think it'll be quite as bad um, as people may uh, are predicting for the Tories, but they are going to certainly um, <laughs> be, be destroyed. But... Not, I don't think to that extent. I do think, however, that Reform are going to get nothing. And Reform may be happy to go around and say, oh, but we gave the Tories a bloody nose. We're the ones who destroyed the Tory party. You're not. The Tories have destroyed the Tory party. It's people are voting for Labour good. because we don't want the Tories anymore. That's yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, people are vote, will vote for Labour because... I mean, a lot of them because they are committed to Labour and all that. But many of them will vote for Labour because, you know, it's 12, 13 years of a single government. They want to change. Yeah, that's uh, it. So Starmer is going to get in, obviously, but he's going to get in kind of by default. Uh, but uh, back in 1997, uh, the Tories, when uh, Blair uh, came in on a landslide, the Tories won 165 seats. This time, they predicted to win 155 seats. But the big question, JJ, is uh, when will the election be? Mm. Uh, Rishi, as usual, on never mind the ballots last night, playing his cards very close to his chest. Take it away, Mr Sunak. Look, there's going to be lots of polls, and you know this better than most, because you've but, covered I mean, they're elections. consistently looking pretty grim, right? But the, what matters is the general election, and that's what I'm focused when is it? on. <laughs> Go I'm on. I'm sure we'll get to that. Tell us. <laughs> Reveal us. We're Sun World exclusive. No. <laughs> but look, on that, I've been clear, actually, because I said, look, we, my working assumption is we'll have an election in the second half you've of the year. You've been clear when it might be. You've no. also ruled out dates. You've ruled no, out no, a no, May no. election. Well, I've been ruled out a May election. But that's because we've got really important local elections to focus on. Uh, well, it, what uh, Harry went on to press him on was if you say it's the second half of, of the year, it could be June. Yeah. And he wouldn't say anything. He, wouldn't, he, did, he didn't say, no, it won't be June. Uh, uh, but uh, the guessing game about the election uh, continues apace. Uh, my, my guess, uh, along with a lot of other people, late October, yours? November. 
That's what I think now. The, the thing about November is that would make sense, but there is this Five Eyes agreement. So these, yeah. the, these five countries, including America and Britain and New Zealand and Australia, a few other countries, have agreed not to have elections in the same month. Now, we know that the United States has got their presidential election in November. So if we have an election here in November, it kind of breaks the Five Eyes agreement. Uh, but a lot of people say the Five Eyes agreement is no big deal, so they might break it anyway. So I, I agree with you. It's going to be late October, maybe sometime in October. Uh, not October, it's sometime in uh, November. So uh, we await with bated breath. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Scottish hate laws. Uh, God, the Scots hate this, and they should. Uh, Hamza Yousaf's hated hate laws. Uh, basically, uh, this is the these are the laws where your kids will be able to report you to the police for stuff you say in your own home. And, of course, uh, at one point, uh, until very recently, we thought it would stop people going up to trans women and saying you're a bloke in a dress. Yeah. But J.K. Rowling has proved that that is not the case. You can do that in Scotland because J.K.'s tweets were ruled to be uh, not criminal. Anyway, the thing is about the Scots is you don't mess around with the Scots. And uh, they, are, they hate this law, this sinister, illiberal law. Uh, North Korean style legislation. And so what they've been doing, they're bombarding the police with complaints <laughs> uh, about their mates, anything for a laugh. So they're coming in at 2,000 a day. The police are inundated. They can't possibly get around to uh, investigating any of them. And uh, as a laugh, uh, thousands of them uh, have reported Hansa Yousaf's uh, 2020 speech in which he said he was sick of being the only non-white person in the room. A lot of people said that was racist. <laughs> anyway, they're complaining about that. They're saying hate hurts and this was a hate-filled speech and more people have complained about Hamza Yousaf's only non-white in the room speech than they have about J.K. Rowling calling <laughs> trans women blokes. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to love the Scottish humour. Yeah. But did you hear what Ali McCoy said? Yeah, Ali McCoy on Talk Sport. Yeah. He was saying that uh, you've got the old firm, Dark the old firm. Up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Rangers and he's right. Celtic, they're going to be shouting hate field things at each other. Everyone in that stadium is going to have to be arrested. Yeah. How are you going to do it, Hamza? This is, this is not. not workable. This is not yeah. workable. And as I say, the Scots have got a great sense of humour. They're also furious about this. And I think he's got to rail back on this ho hopeless law. As I say, it, 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 it uh, replaces, I think it's their 1847 Scottish Blasphemy Act. So you can now swear in Scotland. But it, it actually replaces not swearing and not being nasty to God with a whole raft of orders mm. uh, that uh, basically uh, take away freedom, take back democracy. Look at them. They're furious. It is this weird dystopian place that we're in now where we, we're... If, if you and I say something in private, you could then just go in and, and, and grasp me and be like, yeah, JJ said this, I didn't like it, yeah. officer. By arrest the, him. By the way, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. <laughs> Loads of people will use this law to settle scores. Yeah. Others will do it for a laugh. Uh, and others will, uh, you know, pick on think people that Hamza Youssef didn't think. He thinks he's being sort of uh, liberal and modern and forward thinking. This is repressive sinister North Korean nonsense. And Hamza Yousaf, you've got to think about this law. You've got to get rid of it. It is a disaster, not only for Scotland, for Britain. It's a step back and you should not be doing this. Uh, now, uh, this is a bad year. You've got, kid, you've got a kid, haven't you? Yeah. 90% of teachers in the National Education Union have voted to strike uh, in pursuit of a pay rise. More classroom chaos. Kids suffer yet again. Uh, I mean, I don't know about the the teachers, uh, how justified they are in these demands, but I just worry about the kids. Uh, the teachers also say uh, that, they're, that they're really fed up of Ofsted school inspections because they're bad for their mental health. Poor things. I have to defend the teacher on this one, yeah. only for the Ofsted. What about I, the kids? I think, yeah, listen, for the kids, forget the kids, what about the parents? If my kid has to have, have a week <laughs> off school, it's me have to have to miss work. <laughs> I'm stuck with so selfish. <laughs> <laughs> but with Ofsted, I do think it's outdated. It needs reform. They, you get told you're going to have an inspection during this time period, you put a few lick of paints up, you change everything, and then the teacher on tender hooks waiting for the result. Because if you get uh, the report coming back and it's one star, uh, terrible school, it's, it's, it's horrible. That is horrible for our teachers to have to work under that pressure. Yeah, but they've got to... Well, I think we have to have... I, what I agree with you, uh, 
about is that the system at the moment is a bit ridiculous because you get a load of inspectors go into a school and then two months later one word comes back yeah you know outstanding or uh, you know disappointing or something yeah uh, you need more than that uh, but I do think schools have to be inspected and uh, you know it's pretty weird that teachers are basically railing against exams they don't like being examined uh, examined <laughs> themselves so true. it's you know it's like <laughs> that is very but, true. but we've got to keep up standards and therefore we have to have school inspections just because teachers don't like them tough luck you've got to carry on with your job and try to run a decent school well, but, 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 the, but the reports need to be more than one word that's ridiculous Definitely. but that, the headmistress uh Brian yeah, that, Singh, yeah. Is, that, that headmistress yeah. she she has done a fantastic job uh, in, on her, her inner city school often she'd be going to her and saying what have you done how have you achieved these these uh, amazing grades and standards yeah. and they should be rolling out across the country yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, we just hope that some solution can be uh, reached before uh, this planned strike in September. Because I just after the COVID crisis and uh, other strikes, I mean, these poor kids, give them an education for God's sake. Mm. Right, uh, this is uh, on the couple uh, on the Daily Mail front page this morning. Quite a, a disconcerting story. MPs uh, and parliamentary staffers and political journalists, all working within the Westminster bubble, have been sent uh, phishing uh, attacks. Uh, the, this is P H I S H I N G, uh, honey traps. Uh, basically, they've been getting nude pictures with a kind of film with uh, sexy girls there called Abby. And Charlie, and say, oh, hi, it's Abby. How are you doing? Long time. <laughs> Basically, uh, trying to lure these MPs and political journalists and staff people in Westminster into this honey trap, and therefore they can compromise them. Uh, Ian uh, Duncan Smith says this is a serious attack on democracy, and obviously the implication, JJ, is it might be uh, China or Russia up to their old tricks again. Why do we always blame China? Everything that happens, oh, it's a Chinese, it's Chinese government. It might not be China. Might well, it might not be, <laughs> but it might be. I mean, they're not exactly exemplary in this field. Also, I've got a... I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's just like, what are you going to say next? That Putin's a great leader, like you once did to me. Putin's a very He's a strong leader. man. He's a yeah, strong there man. There you go. Um, but these, these aliases, Abby or Charlie, I know a few male MPs, they won't be interested in, in people called Abby and Charlie. It's John and Jack I'd be interested in. So <laughs> I wonder if, if they're just sending these out as a blanket, whether they're actually properly targeting individuals. Yeah, I, I, this is the point. This is, this is well, no, the, 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 this is the point. They have t chosen specific targets. Right. Uh, so these are cyber attacks on specific a specific number of people, some of them MPs, one of them apparently uh, a uh, shadow cabinet minister and so on and so forth. Uh, this has been revealed by the website Politico. Uh, so well done to you, very good stuff story and a very worrying story. Let's hope they shut that down. Uh, let's talk about uh, the uh, disgraced Spanish soccer chief, Luis Rubiales, who actually, funnily enough, yesterday flew in from uh, the Dominican Republic into Madrid, his home city, of course, where he was immediately arrested uh, on corruption charges, allegations that he took uh, corrupt payments to set up a Spanish cup competition in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we don't know whether or not he's guilty of that, of course, and I'm sure he denies those charges. Uh, but uh, more to the point, he's facing two and a half years in jail for that kiss, the World Cup victory kiss with the female Spanish captain to, to be done. And... If I kissed you on the lips, you'd cuss that section. <laughs> Come here, you. <laughs> I'd give you life. <laughs> a full life sentence, throw away the key. Uh, no, I just say, I think, you know, to, yeah, this, was, this was this uh, was Rubiales' uh, low point. It wasn't a great moment for him. We all know what was going on. They won the cup. He'd had a few drinks and he lit forward and gave her a big smacker. It wasn't a great thing to do. She was upset by it. But I, two and a half years, that is me too gone mad, if you ask me. It's over yeah. the top. Um, what time is it? It's 10 to 10. What time is it on the moon? <laughs> the same time, I guess? No. <laughs> what? No one knows. That's <laughs> the point. No one knows what time it is on the moon. Uh, to wit, the White House has asked NASA their space program, to develop a new lunar time zone so that moon missions 
can be coordinated. It's international moon missions. Now, the, the reason this needs to be done, again, something I didn't know. Uh, uh, well, there's a lot I don't know. <laughs> Yet another thing I didn't know um, uh, is time moves quicker on the moon because of the gravitational uh, pull, field strength there. Uh, so uh, apparently, uh, every every day on the moon is 58.7 microseconds longer than the days here on Earth. So they need to coordinate. So uh, the White House wants a new lunar time zone. I wish they were spending money on um, stopping world world hunger or something instead of trying to figure out what the time is on the freaking moon. What a waste of time and money. Waste of energy. Also, this is what I say about the Spice, spice, spice Programme. <laughs> I'm from London. Spice Programme. <laughs> spice Programme. No, the Space Programme. It's this. Right, uh, man landed on the moon in 1969, right? Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, Buzz Aldrin. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, was only, I wasn't born then. Mr Armstrong. <laughs> uh, and uh, what have they done since then? <laughs> Nothing. Downhill all Nothing. the way. When man landed on the moon in 1969, I do sort of vaguely remember it as a child. And uh, uh, but everybody thought, right, well, within 10 years it'll be like we'll Star be Trek. There. Yeah, you know, we'll be zooming across <laughs> the universe to boldly go where no man has gone before. And, and, and yet, no, no, Nothing. we're not. Right. Nada. Meanwhile, uh, up in Balmoral, you remember that uh, King Charles has opened up. Uh, the uh, favourite holiday home of the Queen to the public. Uh, you can go round uh, on a tour of Balmoral, 100 quid a person, or if you want afternoon tea thrown in, 150. Uh, anyway, the first batch of tickets went on sale yesterday and they, they were immediately snapped up. It's a royal sellout. Everyone wants to go, uh, wants to take part in the Balmoral Bonanza. It was the Queen's favourite home of hers, so I'm not surprised people want to go there. Apparently the Queen used to say, as soon as she crossed those gates of Balmoral, she'd kick off her, her shoes and she felt completely at ease. So mm -hmm. if you're a royalist, this is this is great. It's a bit strange that we own, we do essentially own all these properties as taxpayers yeah. uh, and now we're paying to go into and have a look at some of the rooms. Yeah, the the uh, the Queen was basically a Scottish noblewoman who enjoyed, uh, yeah. just loved to be in Scotland. So uh, you can also get the chance to go to the room where Liz Truss went to see her shortly before the Queen died. So there you are. <laughs> Balmoral, here we come. We'll go at the weekend, shall we? <laughs> uh, sadly, though, JJ, we've come to the end of this show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us in a bit for Cross Talk at 1pm. Cross Talk later on. Up, Up next, next is Julia yeah. Hartley Brewer. JJ will be back with me later. <laughs>